That's, uh, that's a terrific question. Um, well, I think, um, I don't think the BBC myself, um, and we'll, we'll wait to see what the research says, did anything very different in the referendum campaign from what it might normally be expected to do. What happened was that um, it had, uh, so I'm not sure it did, in a sense, compromise its ethos. What happened is its ethos was exposed in a much more controversial political environment than it was used to, because it took the view that the opposing, the opposing set of values were um, trivial, undeveloped, emotional, and the taste of a small minority. <coughs> and I think that was the critical, that was the critical issue. Um, now, there are plenty of people in the BBC who kind of understand the, the ethos issue in terms of audience numbers and weight. Um, they understand, for, you know, they understand the, the geographical distribution of certain Radio 3 and Radio 4 um, listening figures, for example. But as an overall policy, uh, the, uh, one of the key aspects of the ethos is one size fits all. And one size fits all, well, that found it very, very hard going, I think, in 2012-14 on a referendum campaign to effectively end the current state. So I think it was more, not that, it, not that it, you know, I don't want to reflect on, I think the BBC is the greatest huge, don't reflect on, its, on, va, on it to betray its ethos or anything like that. I think it lived up to its ethos, but I think its ethos was actually incompatible with the growth of an, alter, with, with an alternative ethos. I think it's just not possible for an organization like that to, to report things in a way which, which, is fair to both, when it, which is fair to both sides when its notion of side all resides within a certain parameter which is being exploded. Well, part of that was about, uh, about oxygen. Uh, part of it was about what gets reported, which was where, uh, and, and, uh, and part of that, after that, after you've excluded what doesn't get reported, you also have to, get the, you have to look at the, the methodology that underpins the reporting and how it's going to get reported. Um, so that, that takes a large amount of space out. But, but the point about, the key point really is that if you are providing a vision, you can say, and you say what your opponent is going to say, um, the you, could, you will actually just put things into people's minds. If you provide a vision and say, your pensions will be safe in an independent Scotland, pensions! And of course, you know, that's picked up in the next five seconds by a large-scale print or print broadcast outlet which says, pensions will be safe and independent Scotland. Dream on! Exclamation mark. So the, the, the difficulty of, of providing anti-occupy party when you're providing a major positive case for change is that anti-occupy party is one of the ways in which, in which an opening speaker tries to get over their inherent disadvantage of, uh, 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 by, by actually fulfilling some of the closing speakers or the next speaker's functionality. But it's very difficult to do that if you're having to, if you're having to promote major change to a wide audience. It's a fair point. I have to say um, that, I mean, I think, I, I think you're right. That's a really good example. That was, that was one, of the, one of the key good examples but that was, a, I mean, I, I think the thing is that was at a, that was at a stage of um, of rebuttal very close to the close, to the close of play. It was actually really hard to run an aggressive campaign without raising all the issues and allowing them to be taken apart by a wide range of unsympathetic parties at a much earlier stage. I agree that you could say you should run a more aggressive campaign, but there were a lot of people, and I, you know, said this last year in a different context, had to be coaxed towards a situation where they were ready to think to think that yes was a real possibility. And they can't coax people by by um, ultimately those kind of attack that kind of attack uh, rhetoric. You can't coax people that way. So it's about you had to coax the maximum number of people. And that was why there was a great feel good nature about the strategy and it only we only got into rebuttal towards the end. Was that, was that Meet the Yuki person? You can see it in the eye, please. Yeah, yeah, I did. I don't know. I, I, I did see it. I did see it. Um, this was. Uh, it's very interesting. I think. Uh, uh, um, yes, I, I, I agree with that. 
I thought that that well um, did ex did did show something about you uh, about UKIP. But I think that it's a way, um, and certainly if you I think that there, there's some credibility behind that they have had up to now a relatively easy ride. And I think that the, for the BBC to want to include them in prime ministerial debates when they have two seats in the House of Commons, both won by defection, is really an interesting choice. So, uh, so I mean, without, say, I have to say that there are signs that there's pressure on UKIP, and UKIP's vote is dropping ahead of the, of the UK general election. Um, but when there weren't signs of pressure on UKIP, there wasn't a lot of media pressure being put on UKIP. There was one Channel 4 profile of, of Farage last year, but apart from that, given you know, apart from that, you know, it's it's a bit like, and uh, Katrina will understand that, the, the, uh, and others will understand this this uh, this illusion. It's a bit like you know, Scottish history in the context of British history. The Wars of the Roses are kind of regrettable, is a regrettable accident in English history. Uh, but uh, in Scotland, civil strife is kind of the nature of things. Um, but uh, so you know, um, if you find uh, a racist or a member of a racist party or former racist party in UKIP, that's a kind of regrettable accident. But if you find it in another party, it's absolutely terrible. Um, so that, that, uh, there are a lot of there have been example after example of issues of that kind have come forward in the last 12 months. And I have to say, I don't think the, ma the mainstream media have gone for the jugular on them as they would if it was another political party. I really think. That Twitter changes the nature of the statements you make, but as I was indicating, um, a lot of very complex statements depend on a high degree of vacancy. The more space and complexity you can give to a statement is a reflection of your authority. So it's inevitable that as authority becomes authority and this public discourse becomes eroded, statements change. And of course, the other thing is, and there is, that's the, the, the last slide up now, that um, often Twitter feeds are used to, to, to actually direct you to statements or to use Q&As in which conventional political discourse um, can take place. And obviously the Scottish Government are very much to the forefront of that. But the UCL speech there, that was clearly, that was distributed very widely on Twitter. So I think it's a question of knowing what the medium's for, not that the medium changes the ability to, to, make, a me to, to make a message. And as for silence, I don't think there was. I don't think there was silence. I just. I think that um, it's, uh, there was so much noise, and the great thing was that the more noise there was, uh, the more actual activity and engagement there was. This was not a matter of spe This is not a matter of speaking and not acting. So we're not. We're not even in the in the realms of uh, of a Beckett play. People went off to look for Godot. about BBC as an institution and the validity that it has. But when we watch the news, we see the political commentators, and some of them seem to me very dominant, um, not just with square glasses, <laughs> very thick ones. Uh, we always see him coming on at the 10 o'clock news. But I wonder how much individual political commentators within the BBC can create an ethos about themselves and all the balance very good question, and I think that cer certain of them, uh, I mean, I talked about the way in which, which they would say uh, it's, still, it's still relatively strong with most celebrities. Mm -hmm. If you create a celebrity personality, then you will increase the valency of the broadcast, uh, broadcast you represent. And there's some, uh, you know, there, there are some commentators who definitely create a celebrity personality around themselves to a greater or lesser extent more or less, more or less deliberately. They have a style, they have an outlook, they have an approach, um, they have a trademark, and they do that in a way which helps to increase their valency and therefore the valency of the institution that they're working for if they're, if they're delivering politically. There's also, as I'm mentioning, the environment valency. Just as, you know, never referred in 1959 to the Times knowing what was important for the future of Britain because it hung around 10 Downing Street. So hanging around 10 Downing Street is also still a fairly positive valence, a fairly positive valency. Though as I said, that's that is to some extent rather more compromised. It wasn't 1959.